kiln systems also? Yeah, we, we've got a meeting, I think, at three o'clock our time. So we will hang around for a little bit afterwards, but we'll have to go shortly after that. Sounds good. Perfect. Okay, it looks like we're two minutes after the hour. Uh, I guess we'll go ahead and uh, get started. And we will, if any if we have any other stragglers, we'll just... Uh, just join as they come come on anyway. So, um, well, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Um, welcome to the fourth session of our Southwestern Ecological Restoration Institute's wood utilization team. Uh, lumber Introduction to Lumber Dry Kiln Operations Series. This is the fourth in a series of four, uh, again, and um, I'll introduce myself real quickly. My name is Rich Edwards. I'm a research associate um, here at New Northern Arizona University, uh, working specifically in the forest operations biomass utilization program within Ecological Restoration Institute. So uh, welcome again. And if we could, um, if Damon, you could advance the slide, please. And we'll go ahead and just go over some, some housekeeping items. And so just so you know, when you come on, you are muted. Well, unless you're a panelist. Um, as an attendee, when you come on, you're muted and your video is off. And we ask that you please use the chat feature to communicate with other attendees. If you do want to ask questions during the presentations, we ask that you use the Q&A. Um, Feature. And both of those are located at the bottom of your screen. On my screen, the Q&A is on the left and the chat is on the right. So I don't, anyway, they're right, usually right next to each other. So if you could ask, we'll use those guidelines for using them. And just so you know, we are recording and we will post online after the seminar. And we have posted all, I believe all three of the other ones so far. Um, so those are all available for your viewing. Um, and if you're, if you're a member of the Society of American Foresters and you need to get continuing forestry education credits, we ask that you type your name into the chat before the end of the uh, workshop and mention CFE credits um, or just CFE. Um, and also, last but not least, all of the courses, course materials are available on Box. Um, I think yeah, Damon has been posting those. And yes, and he did again. So Damon has posted those uh, that link in the in the chat box, so you can access those. A lot of good materials there. Um, that Patrick provided um, real, you know, very very comprehensive. Uh, if you don't have them already, I would strongly suggest you down uh, download them. So anyway, with that, um, we'll kind of go on and, and I'll just kind of introduce Patrick. Um, Patrick, uh, Dr. Patrick Rappold, and he's, a, he's our regional wood utilization specialist um, in the U.S. Forest Service, Milwaukee, Wisconsin office. He graduated from Virginia Tech 2006. And Dr. Rappel first worked in the engineered wood product sector and, and later for a hardwood lumber manufacturer. Um, after that, he uh, transitioned to Arizona in 2011 and spent nine years with, the, with various public institutions there, uh, working to support forest restoration efforts by providing technical marketing assistance to the forest products manufacturers in the Southwest. As I mentioned, when we first started the, the workshop, uh, Dr. Rappel will be presenting part four. Uh, this is the last part of the four part workshop series on dry kiln operations. And we've specific, he's specifically tailored these presentations for the challenges faced by the forest products sector in the Southwest. So with that, um, 
I'll let uh, Patrick take it over and we've got, looks like we've got a couple guests and some, we're gonna be concentrating on dry kilns today. It's all yours, Patrick. Thanks, Rich. Let me get a confirmation that you can hear me and you can see the uh, title screen if you don't mind. Okay, perfect. Both. So welcome to the uh, fourth week. It's November 22nd. Uh, Thanksgiving is just around the corner here. And so this will be our last uh, session for this. And I want to thank you all for joining the pr previous uh, three sessions. Uh, my contact information is here if you need to follow up with any questions. And we've had some good participants from uh, Nebraska, uh, New Mexico, uh, Colorado. And so a little bit about me, if this is your first week uh, tuning in, I uh, work for the USDA Forest Service in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I spent uh, nine years with Arizona State Forestry in Flagstaff, Arizona, trying to uh, find some markets for to help facilitate the forest restoration activities that were going on in Northern Arizona. And you know, within that uh, nine years, I also spent a lot of time uh, with my counterparts in Colorado, uh, New Mexico, and Utah. And you know, we all kind of had the same issues where we're trying to develop these markets for this uh, restoration forestry activities. And you know, a lot of times we were dealing with uh, very small diameter material that uh, was very tough to dry, very difficult to dry, a lot of drying defects. And so the, the last three weeks, I've been kind of walking through, you know, my suggestions for how to uh, get around some of those defects, you know, whether it's uh, proper stickering, whether it's uh, using uh, time uh, uh, moisture content based dry, dry kiln scheduling. And so uh, previously to uh, work in, in Arizona, I did uh, work as a lumber dry kiln technician for about four years in Southwest Pennsylvania. And so within that, uh, Occupation I did uh, dry up to around 28 million board feet of hardwood lumber per year with uh, two other members of a dry kiln team. And so, uh, you know, a lot of that is uh, the experience I had within the dry kiln world. I did uh, help some businesses within the Arizona region uh, develop some dry kiln schedules for uh, Ponderosa Pine, but in overall, most of my Lumber drying experience is with the uh, hardwood industry, the hardwood lumber. So today we're going to have uh, three guest speakers. We have uh, up first uh, two guest speakers from Nile Systems, and they will talk about the dehumidification drying. I uh, have very little experience with dehumidification dry kilns, and so that is why I brought in some of uh, some of the rep the experts from Nile to talk about the. Uh, dehumidification systems and what that's all about. And then later in the uh, webcast today, we're gonna have uh, uh, Scott Lyon discuss uh, vacuum dry kilning. And so I uh, worked with Scott in Southwest Pennsylvania. We worked for the same company for a couple of years and I now work uh, a lot closer with Scott uh, in Wisconsin and you know, since Scott is with the Wisconsin DNR. And so Scott will be uh, giving us a presentation on vacuum dry kilning within the, uh, the second hour of today's webinar, web, uh, webcast. So I'm just gonna kind of reiterate what we learned from our first broadcast, you know, what, why we're all here. So forest restoration economics, you're typically dealing with small diameter pine, rosa pine, and this material, uh, it's, uh, it's being removed to prevent catastrophic wildfire. And so ponderosa pine, it's, it's very similar in characteristics to that, the eastern white pine. And it uh, was traditionally used for molding and millwork. And this is an image of a sawmill that used to be along uh, Belmont Road in Arizona. And so you can see the distribution of small end lug diameters there. And that is pretty typical of that uh, byproduct of forest restoration activities. The biggest uh, issue with uh, the small diameter ponderosa pine is a uh, preponderance of juvenile wood. This is uh, the inner core of the wood. It tends to have a lot of knots and it's not, uh, it doesn't uh, have a fully formed uh, S2 cell wall layer yet. And so it tends to do a lot of uh, uh, twisting and warping a lot more than you would typically see in uh, older larger diameter trees. And so, you know, it's just one of those uh, 
real challenges when working with ponderosa pine from the forest restoration activities. And that's why I think, you know, uh, I think dehumidification systems and vacuum systems may offer some great solutions to um, dealing with that juvenile wood. And so what comes out of this ponderosa pine uh, trees, uh, this is typically the uh, grade yield distribution that you see. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of three common. And so your, your economics, your uh, profitability margins are very tight with these, uh, you know, with, with sawing, processing and drying these, these small diameter ponderosa pine. And so when you dry it, you add value to it. And so you, that can go either way. If you come out with a lot of drying defects, you know, you can actually uh, have a lot of degrades, then you're going down to the four common and you're essentially uh, losing a lot of your profit. And so that's why you always want to engage in uh, uh, appropriate kiln drying, you know, uh, Definitely, you want to maximize your dry kilns. You don't want to you don't want to have any more than five percent degrade in your uh, grade recovery. So that's why you always want to make sure that everything is uh, calibrated and tuned proper, properly. Uh, make sure your dry bulb temperature, your dry bulb RTD, and your wet bulb sensors are calibrated, and that you know, everything is operating, especially the uh, baffle systems and your fans. So this this uh, this bar graph here, this is from actual uh, logs that were sawn at a uh, at a modern sawmill in uh, a different part of the country. This was uh, ponderosa pine logs, and this uh, graph here is just kind of the uh, the distribution of small end log diameters that um, we had sawn. So this is again, this is the outcome, and this is the input. So you can see, you know, this is uh, what I would call pretty typical of what is coming off the forest restoration, forest restoration activities, uh, very small diameter material. And, you know, as I uh, turn this presentation over to our guest speakers, you know, I, I just uh, would invite them to comment on this grade yield distribution, you know, like, what do you think of it? Have you seen this, um, this type of distribution in other parts of the country where you work in, you know, maybe other continents, other nations, you know, where you see this fairly low grade distribution, but, you know, it's, um, it's just part of that forest restoration economics of the Southwest. And so because this is a Forest Service sponsored webcast, I do have to uh, talk about discrimination. And so during this webcast, we cannot discriminate. And if you believe that di discrimination did occur during this webcast, there is a Office of Civil Rights, you can contact and uh, report anything you uh, have a, of concern. And USDA is an equal opportunity provider, employer, and lender. I also want to have us refrain from uh, any antitrust issues today. You know, we should refrain from talking about lumber prices. Uh, if our guest speakers do want to talk about costs, you know, they, they are free to talk about uh, costs of systems, operating costs, drying costs, but, you know, let's, as a whole, let's just refrain from talking about lumber market costs and lumber prices and where that's going, just to uh, avoid any antitrust issues. So here's just a list of books and manuals that um, the beginning dr wood dryer may be interested in, and so... Uh, Terry Connors at the University of Kentucky, he has put together several good uh, PDF files for the uh, novice dry kiln person. And they're just really good at summarizing some of the, some of the uh, topics I've been going over the last four, four weeks, you know, at a very high level. And so it's really tough in this virtual environment to uh, get, you know, down to the uh, finite details of lumber drying, especially, you know, when most of my experience is hardwood drying. And I think most of the, well, most of the attendees, whether uh, live or uh, after the fact, you know, listening to this, viewing this webcast are going to be softwood species, people drying their lumber, you know, at, and so like in the Southwest, there is some hardwood lumber being dried, whether it's uh, cottonwood or mesquite, but I, I would say in general, most of the Southwest, uh, Colorado, Utah, definitely Arizona, it's gonna be a preponderance of ponderosa pine. And I do include uh, two links here for some uh, very 
basic plans, some very basic diagrams of uh, building your first dehumidification dry kiln. And so it does include the, uh, the walls, you know, the, 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 the four walls and the ceilings and the fans, but it also does go in a little bit about the, the DH units. And so if you're just, you know, tipping your, dipping your toes into the lumber drying business and you're not quite ready to uh, invest in uh, a commercially made unit, you know, these two publications do provide some broad overviews. And, you know, I have seen some of these homemade dehumidification drying units um, in person and, you know, they um, work to a certain degree of expectations and, but, you know, it all comes down to uh, maintaining your equipment and making sure the equipment is uh, running properly. So just some week three highlights. Uh, we did talk about uh, calculating uh, equilibrium moisture content and why, why that's important. It's uh, 35 degrees right now in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, furnace has been on for about a month now. And so, you know, a lot of the wood is starting to uh, shrink and move. And so it's a little bit different than say in Alabama right now, where I'm sure it's a little bit less relative humidity, but it's still, you know, a lot more higher relative humidity than say uh, Milwaukee or Madison, Wisconsin right now. And then in week three, we also talked about drying schedules. And so my recommendation for drying ponderosa pine was uh, moisture based, uh, moisture content based schedulings. And, you know, if any of our guest speakers have any better suggestions, you know, if maybe there's a, a good opportunity for a time-based kiln schedule for ponderosa pine, I, I would definitely be um, open to hearing those suggestions. And then at the end of week three, we talked about um, equalizing and conditioning your lumber. So that is uh, very important, whether you have a conventional steam kiln or you have a dehumidification unit or a vacuum kiln is to get those stresses out. And so we'll be um, asking lots of, lots of questions today about you know, how, how the different systems, drying systems uh, do equalize the lumber and do condition the lumber. And so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and invite uh, Elijah and Henko to start, uh, come on camera and deliver a presentation and feel free to introduce yourselves, uh, where you work, what you do and uh, what your background is. Like, let me see if I can get my screen going here. So Elijah, it's only uh, 35 degrees in Milwaukee. What is it up there in Maine? Is it a bit uh, oh. more? Uh... It we've, we've, got, uh, we've got about that in rain going on right here now. Okay. So not uh, not fun by any means, that's for sure. A lot, uh, lot cooler than you guys down in the southeast, southwest. I got to just. And then Scott Lyon is in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. So we'll, uh, we'll get his uh, weather update later. <laughs> Getting it, Eli? Yeah, I got to give my computer permission to share my screen. So I first met Eli, uh, Elijah at uh, in Antigo, Wisconsin. Uh, he was at a lumber drying course, and I'll provide some information on that lumber drying course uh, later in the hour, and I'll also provide some information about how to uh, attend some in-person drying courses across the country. I have a uh, so some general listings, you know, everything's kind of up in the air right now with um, the second wave of COVID coming across the country. And so that's why we chose to do this uh, particular session uh, virtually. We were supposed to be in Albuquerque last week, but instead we decided to do a four week uh, virtual session. Hey, Patrick, if I send it to you, do you think you'd be able to put it up? For sure. Share it with you on the, on the Google there. I don't know why it's not letting me here. All right. I can maybe carry on and introduce myself so long. Sounds good. Guys figure it out. Uh, my name is Henko Fulyun. I um, hail from down south and probably the furthest southern boy that you'll ever meet 
on this uh, presentation. I come all the way from, from South Africa. Uh, I was born into a sawmilling family. I'm a third generation sawmiller. I studied with technology at um, Nelson Mandela University down in South Africa with a bachelor's degree in wood technology. Uh, I also did um, an advanced diploma in industrial automation through uh, a company in Australia. And I got some IT background. So all in all, my background is wood science, wood technology, and automation. Um, I'm still part, I still own a, a consulting company back in Africa that does kiln drying consulting. Most of the drying we've done there is, is on species similar to Southern yellow pine. And if you go further down south, there's some slower drying pine species. And then there's also, of course, uh, a lot of the eucalyptus species that are being dried. Um, I still own a small kiln drying plant uh, in Nysna in, in the Western Cape, and um, which, I still, which I still run remotely from my laptop. Uh, yeah, my, my experience spans about almost 20 years in the timber drying game. I've done the automation of about 200 drying kilns from steam to hot water, uh, dehumidification, uh, pine uh, boards, poles, um, other commercial hardwoods, also uh, some uh, ISP and 15 e treatment stuff. So yeah, that's basically my background. I've, Mal brought me on board as a as a drying specialist for the products initially. Well, back in Africa, dehumidification are not really big, um, mainly due to people not understanding the real basics of it. Uh, so since I got on board with Nile in the last three years, we've done a lot of uh, system development and looking at, at how we control the DH, especially for faster drying species to make the control better and, and cut down on energy usage. So yeah, that is my, uh, that is my short life on kiln drying. Down to you, Eli. I think I should have gone first, Hanko. Your list is a little longer than mine. <laughs> I, uh, I've, I grew up with family in the lumber industry and have been around sawmill equipment for most of my life. Joined Nile a, a couple of years ago, started out doing kiln installs on our larger projects, um, working out in the manufacturing shop, building our, our units here in-house, um, eventually moving up to service for, for a year and a half or so, um, helping our guys out, uh, out in the field and now do kiln sales. Um, about three, coming on three years at Nile now, um, and I definitely still have a lot to learn, but um, becoming an expert on DH day by day, just as we hope to, to get you guys a little closer by the end of this. Well, I got to tell you, you know, the timber industry is a huge family and everywhere you go, even though you think you know something, you always learn something new. You know, um, just listening to, to Patrick and his background, and I'm pretty sure the rest of the guys on the panel, I don't personally know any of you, but, you know, there's so much so much knowledge shared among all of us in the timber industry. And, and you know, that's what makes it really special. And, and, you know, it's an honor to be part of this, this whole movement and to be invited to come and share some knowledge and information with you guys. Thank you for that. And uh, Elijah, I'm not sure if you can advance or not, so I can do it for you if need be. I think if you give me two clicks for now and then I'll, I'll holler at you when I need you after that. So basically, uh, I'm going to give you guys a brief rundown on what DH is um, in simple form, and then we'll kind of go into some of the details uh, throughout the rest. Um, it, it largely is a process that was designed to make dry kilns more efficient. Um, you see in conventional steam kilns that the, the, one of the primary ways to remove moisture is to vent out a lot of the steam from within the kiln, which mm -hmm. causes your heater, your heating element to, to draw a lot more power than it needs to. Um, a, a DH unit uses a refrigeration system and, and an internal heater and an outside box to actually heat the chamber, maintain the temp temperature within the chamber, and instead of venting out all of the moisture, it actually comes through that compressor system, through the condenser, and would be drained out the rear. It's not to say that DH kilns don't use venting. Um, they do. However, in DH kilns, venting is more of a, a component of the heating element as opposed to moisture removal. Um, it's used as an over temperature vent. So if you have your set point at let's say 120 degrees, for example, 
your your vent would open up if you were to go beyond that set point to bring the temperature back down to what you what you have on your dry bulb. By removing the need to to vent out your excess moisture, the the efficiency by keeping a stable line um, of draw in your heating system um, increases your overall efficiency of of the system itself. Um, in in all aspects of kiln drying, no matter what type of, of kiln you're using, the most important thing is to, to maintain the highest level of control of your environment, which will in turn give you the best end product. As far as the process, chambers heated up to your desired wet bulb or your dry bulb temperature, um, allowing the moisture to to escape from the wood and be, be removed from the chamber. Um, overhead circulating fans are, are used to take the air that would come out of the heating system within the unit that also houses the, the condenser system, pass it over and through the lumber, and then in turn come back into that system to be removed by the condenser. Vents are used to monitor temperature, like I said, um, within a certain margin of error. For example, in our units, I wanna say, I think oh, it's two degrees above um, set point when, when those vents kick off in our um, smaller L-series units. Um, for water removal, it's, it's the condenser system like we talked about. Um, Heating system will draw in moisture, dense air once the chamber reaches a certain humidity. So in, in a DH kiln, you have a dry bulb and a wet bulb. So instead of just having your, your dry bulb reading, which is your temperature, the difference between the two of those is, is what's used in the control to call for the compressor to come on, at which point it would remove some of that moisture from the air. All of that, once it's done in the condenser system is drained out the rear of the kiln using a drain pipe, pretty standard procedure. For, for smaller scale operations, DH has, has often been the only real use um, was in smaller operations. I think Patrick, if you wanna give me a, a click there, I think I might be on to the next one. Um, it's, it's only been seen as a benefit in smaller operations. Larger, larger mills and, and companies have been sticking with or saying that steam in conventional kiln is the best way to do it, but that could not be far from the truth. Um, it's especially useful in, in the small scale though, because with, with doing smaller load sizes and oftentimes guys that have smaller concentration yards or, or are doing custom milling will run different species through. Um, so DH gives you a lot of options as far as setting your own schedules and, and being able to set different environments for different species um, and not have like the large systems like the industrial and commercial guys have that are designed to do one type of lumber and one type of lumber only. Just for example, going off of that point here at Nile, we sell, build and sell over 500 of our smaller L series, um, L53 and, and L200 units, which are designed for anything 4,500 board foot and less. Um, and we do 25 and up um, 50 board foot chambers and DH units for, for large scale industrial projects as well. So it is something that is being used across the board. As far as comparison to solar kilns, and I know that you guys are planning to talk about uh, vacuum kilns as well, so we can touch on that too. Um, my first point is, is, have you ever met a weatherman that is right 100% of the time, or even 50% of the time? The, the, the biggest drawback to solar kilns is, is the unpredictability. Like I was saying with, with being able to maintain control of your environment, solar kilns, it's a little bit more difficult to do that because you are relying on conditions that are well out of your control. So the, the solar kilns can have a use within the lumber industry for sure. It's not to say that they're obsolete or, or a bad idea. They do have a low cost of entry, low operational cost, and they're, they're pretty easy to set up and run. However, if you're looking for a controlled outcome in a timely manner, it's, it's tough to, to use in, in a setting where you'd be looking to profit a business. If, if someone is Say, for example, you want a thousand board foot a year to, to woodwork with in your garage, that's all you've got time for. A solar kiln would be great for you. However, if you're looking to turn loads around in, in a timely manner for, for customers or for, for projects that do have a timeline, it's probably not going to be as effective for you just due to the unpredictability. Let's see. I think for that one, we'll come back to that. If you guys have any questions, we can go a little bit more in depth into the differences there. And Kenko, this is where you're going to take over for a bit. Eli, I just want to add a little bit um, to what you said about the, the, the DH kilns and uh, the energy use. Now, for me, I've 
played around with many technologies. I've, I, like I said, I have that little drying plant back in Africa, and we tried many different approaches. We ran uh, industrial heat pumps running hot water and using the hot water in, in the air to water heat exchange to dry the hardwood species. And from the experience I gained at, at, at Nile with the small DH units, especially uh, when it comes to um, capital expenditure to get a operational kiln that will constantly deliver a predictable outcome. And in terms of energy efficiency, there are not many things that can, can, can beat the small uh, dehumidification units. Not even saying only now, any um, uh, dehumidification system that's designed to dry timber and is designed to handle the harsh conditions or the harsh VOCs that comes out of it, you know, if it's if it's if it's operated correctly and it's managed correctly, you know, it's it's really really it's really the way to go. Um, I noticed, Patrick, you guys have done a bit on the scheduling and also on the uh, what is it called equalizing and conditioning on your previous slideshow. So I'm not going to dig too much into that. Um, so I'm going to be digressing a little bit off <laughs> my planned slideshow. I'm going to give you the same info that you had before. So when it comes to drawing schedules, and the way I've always looked at it is, especially on the softwoods, is to make sure that you are within the safe drying limits of the species. That is your number one priority. Next thing is you must be able to understand the balances of your constraints in your kiln. And when I say the, the balances of the constraints, I'm referring to your energy availability, your airflow availability and distribution, and your venting capacity or your, or your moisture removal capacity. And um, when it comes to venting, uh, a lot of people, only think that venting is meant to get rid of moisture. Where in my mind, venting has two very distinct purposes. And I'm gonna first only refer to open close venting um, and also to, to uh, proportionate or, or modulating venting. Now, in open close venting, when your vents are open, it's obvious to get your wet bulb down. What people don't realize when your vents are closed, that is when everything must be in such a balance that you have complete and total energy transfer to your timber. And balancing your venting with your schedule will enable you to achieve maximum energy transfer to your timber and maximum moisture removal capacity, provided you stay within the safe drying speed limits of your species. Now, the beauty of, of dehumidification and um, call it the next best thing after dehumidification is your, your heat recovery vents. I'm not going to dig too much into that. But in any case, the fact that you're running a DH system, you are constantly recycling the same air inside your, inside your chamber. So you don't have that pressure drop the moment the vent opens. Um, I often refer to to proportionate venting or, or modulating vents as um, jokingly saying you're trying to inflate a tire that has got a big gash in the sidewall. You're losing pressure as long as your vents are open. If you are losing pressure, the air is going to take the path of least resistance, which is out of the vents. That means inevitably you are losing a certain percentage of the air that you're trying to force through the timber. Uh, now, Exactly what that percentage is, I don't know. I'm sure somebody has studied it before. Maybe it's only two or three percent. Maybe it's higher. Um, it may even be as high as twenty percent. I don't. I cannot give you a figure. I'm not a scientist. I'm a more of a hands-on guy. I just, I just say, listen, you need to get this thing balanced to get the best out of it. Now, obviously, for schedules, as I said, it's your, it's your speed limits. Um, uh, I 
very often consult with a dry kiln operator's manual. You also showed a picture of this, the other one, uh, drying schedules for commercial species. That's the other one that's also lying on my desk or normally open on my screen. And um, I always say to guys, you know, these books were written and you should read the whole book. Don't just read the time schedules part of it. Start at the beginning and go through the whole thing because it will give you a much better understanding of what the drying schedule is, is trying to tell you. For instance, if you, maybe you can go to the next page for me, please, Patrick. For sure. And I'll just add, you know, I, the uh, mesquite, the velvet mesquite in the Southwest, I think is very similar to like the mahogany that you may be drying in, in uh, Africa. So you know, just yeah. a point of reference. So, um, where was I? So your your drying schedules that you get from the books, I've taken out the T three C three schedule on this on this slide. I was asked about the drying schedules for eucalyptus in Hawaii, and well, I've dried a lot of eucalyptus back in Africa, and I use the eucalyptus diversity color. Uh, schedule, which is the T3C3. Now, just just to give you an, an idea of, of, of how you need to interpret what you're seeing when you look at a schedule, and this is why I say you should read the whole manual, not just the schedule section on it, because the schedule section does not have a column that says, this is the airflow speed, this is your energy transfer rate. It just gives you a bit of a guideline. So, so for me, it's good to start there. You must realize that if your airflow is very high in the kiln, as opposed to being very low in the kiln, these, these set points that, that's being um, uh, uh, pushed forward or, or, or presented in a, in, a, in a typical schedule may differ significantly. Uh, if you have more airflow, you can typically run a slightly higher humidity in your kiln and still have the same amount of energy transfer and, 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 and drying rate, as opposed to Let's say, look at this one, it says 110 over 105 uh, for, for your moisture content when you're above 40. If you have very high airspeed, you could probably run it 110 over 106 or 107 and still maintain, maintain the same drying rate that you would have at a lower EMC. Um, so yeah, we were, you guys were talking about Ponderosa fine and all the other fines. Um, I always say to you guys, if you cannot find the exact species, go and look in the family group. There's a thing called specific gravity of timber. Now, not being, um, uh, not growing up with the inches and pound system, um, but more on metric, specific gravity makes a lot of sense to me because it's an expression of what the weight of the timber is per ton per cubic meter. And I can, I can almost see people frowning. Why do we work with board food in this country? What's this thing with cubic meters? In any case, so if you, had, if you had to find a species, you were looking for a species, and you cannot find the exact um, uh, species in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the books that are available, go and look within the family. If it's a fine, and you find that the specific gravity is, is more or less the same as the species you want to dry, and there is a schedule for that other PC, you can probably start with that one as a guideline. And this is the thing that makes a, 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 an experienced kiln operator. You don't jump around in big steps from this. Start with what they give you and change one thing at a time and observe what difference it made and only decide after you've analyzed the result whether you want to change go up or down with whatever settings you have. Uh, schedule development should be left for somebody that has done it for years. We often go to kiln sites and there's a schedule that's stuck against the wall and you ask the operator, so what's the kiln supposed to be doing in step three? I don't know, I don't know. That's what it says, that's the moisture content is there and it's that's we just follow that schedule. We have almost no idea why we should be doing it. That's the thing. And we were told, if you don't do it like that, it's going to be a stuff up. But you can have indicators from what you see from that. If you, for instance, are running at 
let's say you at step five in the schedule is supposed to be running 130 over 95, but your kiln is not even venting. You should think uh, maybe, you know, maybe that step is not where we want to be. Maybe we should be going a little bit harsher. So your, your venting and the graphs or the interface that you've been presented with very often gives you very good clues of what you should be applying during that step or the next step in your drying process. Um, yeah, we at Nile have our own little uh, um, drying groups that we've, that we've grouped the timbers in, especially for the small DH. Uh, I want to go back to what Eli said about the DH. You know, DH is not that much different from a standard kiln. You don't have to go way out to find a completely different fancy drying schedule as opposed to what you see there. It's just a different way of moving moisture out of timber. You know, at a specific temperature and airflow, that timber species will part with the moisture inside it at that specific rate. Provided it's a safe rate for that species, whether you remove it through dehumidification or through traditional venting, it's still the same species. You can almost apply exactly the same schedule. Um, so from our little schedule, we, we, we split it into four groups. A group one is typically your very fast drying pines. Uh, you can just go flat out, switch on the compressor and turn your temperature up to a safe temperature and still run. There's nothing else you have to do. You know, typically Southern yellow pine. People say you can't really damage Southern yellow pine. Um, I gotta tell you, I've seen people make aeroplane propellers out of, especially <laughs> that juvenile wood that you were referring to earlier, mainly because of serious differential shrinkage between your, your, your core and your, and your more, more um, uh, mature wood. So the one will shrink a lot more than the other one and, and it twists and shouts in all kinds of funny directions. Generally in, in the DH, um, because the condition is fairly stable um and you can maybe jump to the next slide for me patrick please uh, because your condition is fairly stable when it gets to conditioning uh, equalizing conditioning um and it's at lower temperatures and it takes a, a bit longer to dry normally you don't have that big margin of difference in moisture contents. Um, so your, your equalizing is normally a little bit shorter. Uh, you guys discussed your equalizing in your, in your previous class, I assume, where, where, where you decide that which stage do your equalizing and your conditioning. So I'm not gonna dig into that too much. Uh, the slide that I'm showing at the moment was from a kiln also back in Africa and I've, I'm busy implementing this with the programming that we're doing in Nile is to is to have a a very slowly decreasing or increasing uh, depression based on the way the timber reacts to your energy input so you don't have a, a Manhattan skyline type of, of, of drying schedule the moment the wet bulb reacts slower it means there's less moisture coming off you can either put your dry bulb up a little bit or your wet bulb down a little bit just to to maintain and achieve a, 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 a fixed flow rate of moisture out of your timber and um, that's what i did with with, with this specific kiln you can go to the next slide sure Please. and uh just, just to confirm you know you can condition and equalize with a dh unit so i think that would be important to uh impart upon the uh the viewers that you know you're you're not limited by the technology in terms of equalizing and conditioning correct no not at all you can still equalize and condition uh i mean for for equalizing normally push your temperature up about 10 degrees from your final running temperature and well, as you as you all know it's to bring your wetness sample down without drying uh, the drying driest one out further you're going to set your target to to uh target minus two until your wettest reaches your target moisture content. You know, the equalizing part works exactly the same as in any other kiln. 
uh, same for conditioning. I mean, you know, conditioning is main, mainly to relieve drying stresses, which in case hardening. And uh, you basically just add moisture to the, to the outer fibers to relax the stresses in the timber. <coughs> and of course, um, you have your hardwood with moisture content plus four and softwood will be for plus three. Um, in the smaller kilns, you can add a, a, a atomizing spray or a mist spray. In our, in, our, in our test chamber that we have at now, it's a little 20 foot container with a small VH unit in there. We've just added uh, sprays, mist sprays like you'd have in a in your greenhouse. You know, you're not sitting with, with um, millions of board feet in the kiln. You know, it's two or three or 4,000 board feet. Um, you're not adding, you don't have to add 500 gallons of water just to, to, to condition it. Um, so that mist spray is, 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 is more than adequate. Of course, for the bigger kilns, atomizing sprays uh, work very well. It's got its pros and its cons um, uh, over and above uh, the way you do it with steam. But um, I think that's probably a, a story for a completely different slideshow. Uh, but yeah, that's that's about it on equalizing and conditioning without rewriting the book that you guys <laughs> wrote last last week. So let's see what's on our next slide. Patrick, too, uh, you, you were talking about <clears throat> some of the, the units that you've seen that have been made from parts and equipment that's pulled from here and there. It's, it's the same thing with, with the spray systems, too, for guys that have an, an at-home kind of modified manufactured kiln. Um, you can go out to Lowe's and buy an atomizing spray system for pennies compared to, to some of the larger spray systems in the big kilns, and, and it works just fine. Sure, and I just uh, I went back to this slide here because you were talking about eucalyptus, and uh, from what I've seen in eucalyptus, it, it reacts very much to drying like a ponderosa pine does. If it has a lot of juvenile wood, you get a lot of twisting and cupping. And so how did your drying schedule here uh, help to decrease the amount of, you know, cupping and twisting in that eucalyptus? Well, contrary to what, what people always believe, on this little kiln that I had, I don't have a lot of airspeed. I've got less than 100 feet per minute coming out. The stacks are also not that wide, so it's very comparable to, to a container kiln. The loads are slightly wider. Uh, they're about six feet wide as opposed to four feet wide in a container kiln. Um, if you look at the T3, 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 C3 schedule, which is the one that is recommended by the, the operators, uh, kiln operator's manual, you look at the schedule that I, that I adjusted from that, you'll see there is quite a bit of a difference. And I basically applied the rate of change in my wet bulb to, be, to make me decide when to move on to the next step. And I came up with a, with a, with a, slow, a slow dropping or, or, or slowly increasing um, wet bulb depression. And um, in fact, the drying time that I got from that, if you go and look at eucalyptus schedules, mm -hmm. it's, it's very similar to, to how they want you to dry oak. So you have to air dry it for a certain amount of time to get the moisture down, and then you stick it in the kiln uh, for three to four weeks. And I've dried eucalyptus in, in my little kiln from freshly cut in well under three weeks at very, very constant conditions. Uh, the, the amount of cupping and even splits we saw was, was very, very, very limited, mainly because we had complete and total control right from the word go, which you don't always have with, with air drying. Uh, I mean, people will tell you, rightly so, that your, your biggest damage happens before you stick in the kiln. I will always use the 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 comparison if you go to a, to a restroom and you wash your hands you stick it under that uh, blower to, to dry the water off your hands you know you've got 100 percent moisture content on your hands you stick it in there for five seconds and the water is gone and that air is not even that hot now imagine what happens to the surface of a board 
if it gets exposed to slightly hot, dry air, even for a few seconds. Um, not very scientific. I probably cannot prove it exactly, but in my mind, what happens, you dry out that surface, surface layers. And what happens when you dry it out, it shrinks. And if it shrinks, it becomes a higher density barrier. And the moment you have a higher density barrier, moisture will move, move through that higher density barrier slower than what it would, would move through a barrier that is not high density. Um, that's why I always, I've always been an advocate to get it in the kiln as quickly as possible and as economically viable as possible because it's not always economical to do that. Uh, if you're limited on space and how quickly it can dry, you have to dry certain species at a certain speed, otherwise you're just going to honeycomb and and go crazy with all kinds of other funny things with it. So, so yeah. Thank you for that. And uh, I know uh, Henko and Elijah have a meeting at the top of the hour. So we have about uh, eight minutes left of their time. And so feel free to type any questions into the uh, window over there and we will address those. And so what, what I wanted to point out here on this kiln chart is, you know, Henko had the ability to control airflow. And so if you're building your own DH units, you know, and you just buy a attic fan from like Lowe's or Home Depot, you may not have the ability to slow down that fan speed. And so if you're drying a very uh, sensitive species like a eucalyptus or, you know, some of your ponderosa pine uh, uh, lumber thicknesses, you know, and you can't control that fan speed, you know, that will greatly affect your, uh, your, your drying quality because I mean, you know, and that's, you know, I, I, I don't, um, you know, it's just a big difference between building something yourself with an alternating current and, you know, buying it from a commercial manufacturer. So I'll point that out and I will go back down to your uh, contact information. So the other question I had is um, conditioning. So in the Southwest, well, I mean, a uh, question is uh, phytosanitation. So in the Southwest, a lot of the product, a lot of the ponderosa pine is going south of the border across international markets to Mexico in the shape of uh, three by four or six by eights for the uh, pallet parts market in Mexico. And so I didn't know if uh, if your DH systems had the ability to get that phytosanitation stamp and, you know, get that core temperature up. On the, on the latest upgrade that we've done on the smaller units, we've added a module specifically for heat treatment. Now, um, it has the ability it's got extra score probe that you can add into the timber and you can specify how long you want your timber to be at a specific temperature. And it would time date stamp the certificate straight from the PLC's real-time clock. And also once it's done, it would stop automatically and it would also email you a CSV file of that the whole process. So it is possible that the, the big thing that you must realize when it comes to focus sanitizing or, or heat treatment of timber is the amount of energy that you require to do that core temperature varies greatly with moisture content of your timber. If your timber was down to 12 or 15 percent, you'll probably get to it fairly quickly, uh, especially if the rest of the chamber and the timber is already quite hot. Um, but if it's wet, you must keep in mind that, you know, a wet bulb is essentially a, a probe with a, with a cellulose piece of fiber over it. And when you stick a wet bulb or a probe into a wet piece of timber, you actually have the same thing. Um, you are going to battle to get that temperature, that core temperature of that timber up much higher than a wet bulb would go in that same condition. So I always say to guys, you want to, you want to, when I heat treat something, um, it will always be better to have it dry and then heat treat it because you're probably going to use a third of the energy than you would have used to heat treat it if it was wet or over 35%, 40% for that matter. Make sense? For sure. Thank you. And you know, that, that is one benefit of the Southwest is, you know, you do have those low, very low relative humidity conditions up, you know, just outside, lots of sun. And so you can air dry some of those pellet cans down to, you know, below fiber saturation points, then, you know, use a system such as a DH unit to uh, do the phytosanitation. Uh, another question I had in my head is, is you know, uh, 
elevation above sea level. So, you know, Flagstaff, Arizona, it's 6,900 feet above sea level. You know, you're above a mile above sea level. You know, how would you have to adjust the DH unit to compensate for that elevation? The thing is with your DH chamber, one of the most important things with your DH chamber, it must basically seal off completely. It's even more critical to have a chamber that seals off very, very well, as opposed to having a normal steam, steam kiln. I was actually in Flagstaff about a week or two ago, busy working there on a, on a nice big project. Um, so, you know, I would say the same probably applies to another kiln, to any other kiln that you would go high above sea level. I'm not, uh, this is one of the things that has always been a little bit confusing. I have to sit and read the statement and figure it out <laughs> exactly how the height above sea level uh, uh, interacts with it. But I mean, if you really think about it, and the next speaker will be talking about vacuum kilns, the, the, the higher you go above sea level, um, the lower the boiling temperature of water becomes. So, so theoretically, you should be able to pull moisture, the same amount of moisture at a lower air pressure at a slightly lower temperature when you go higher above sea level. Um, so that's more or less my take on that. You know, I don't think it's gonna make a difference in days in drying time, maybe hours, but definitely not in days. Well, thank you. and. Uh... I see we are two minutes to the hour, so uh, I'll let you gentlemen go to your next meeting. Um, do you have any um, issues with us sharing your presentation to the uh, the group, the people that have registered for these for these workshops? Well, you're welcome to Hello. share it, and and, and uh, you know, if any guys, anybody has any questions about about dehumidification, um, they, our email address is there, and if you if you if you contact any of us, me or Eli. We normally make time to give you guys some answers if you have questions regarding uh, drying schedules for a species. Um, our experience is not only on the edge, it spans a little bit wider. So if you, you know, we give, we, we help people where we can. And we're not always going to try and sell you something because we are supposed to be salespeople. But, you know, uh, we'll, we'll give you uh, the information that we have. Well, thank you very much. and. With that, I wish you a uh, happy holiday and I'll be sure to uh, provide your contact information. Anybody that uh, you know contacts this group with any additional uh, follow-up questions on Nile or uh, DH units. Patrick, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. And so with that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, see Scott Lyon. So Scott is a Forest Product Specialist with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources out of Green Bay, Wisconsin. As I said before, I uh, worked with uh, Scott in the industry for a while. I've seen Scott uh, stack eight quarter kiln dried material all day long. So, you know, I always tell Scott's supervisors, you know, you're just not completely working him hard enough. You know, I, I've seen Scott do lots of physical labor. He, he always has more to give. So with that, I'll turn it over to Scott and let me know if you need any help right, uh, sharing. Thanks. Sharing. Appreciate that. Um, let's see here if I get my presentation up. <clears throat> All right. Patrick, can you see my presentation? I let's sure see. can. Good. Well, like as Patrick said, I worked with him, <clears throat> excuse me, back in, uh, God, it was right before the recession in uh, 20, 2009. And uh, before that, I was in, I graduated from Penn State in uh, wood products uh, marketing. And then uh, started out working with uh, a softwood building distribution company down in um, Baltimore. So I sold a lot of products to the, the central part of uh, the East Coast, uh, ranging from uh, softwood lumber to panel products to engineered wood products. And then right after that, I went and worked with Patrick at a, a hardwood mill. And then uh, well, the recession came along and decided to go back to graduate school and got my master's at Virginia Tech doing um, international marketing and wood products, and then uh, did a little bit more research afterwards and then ended up here in Wisconsin about almost eight years ago now. So I do utilization and marketing here. A little bit of everything pretty much uh, from developing markets all the way to kiln drying and, and also um, working one-on-one -on -one with a lot of people on just uh, 
unique projects that they have on their own in their in their operations too. So, but uh, today I'm going to hear talk about understanding vacuum drying technologies for commercial lumber product product production uh, applications. So, a little bit of a history here. Um, today's learning objectives. We're going to talk about a history of vacuum drying, and then. Um, Talk about some comparing drying methods between conventional and vacuum drying. Uh, you, you'll go away with learning a little bit about how vacuum drying works, some of the advantages and disadvantages, and some of the research findings that uh, we have done here with Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources with a vacuum kiln that we have available to us at a tech college up in northern Wisconsin that Patrick, uh, that we typically do our, our kiln course to live every uh, August um, that Patrick uh, attended this past year too. So, but that's the picture of our the vacuum kiln we have there, it's a press uh, dry system. So it's the plates that are filled with uh, hot water and then it dries the lumber through heating and, and, and applying a vacuum, which I'll highlight a little bit more in depth next. So, but going on a little bit of the history. So vacuum drying isn't really new. It's been around since the early 1900s. Here's a uh, patent back to 1904 of a vacuum kiln for drying timber. Basically what would happen here is that uh, the, the timber would be placed in this chamber, it would be sealed, it, it would start heating up and um, through you know, water, I think it is, or pressure at the time, and um, or steam, I should say, and then the steam would be sucked out with the vacuum and that would keep going over in cycles until that timber piece would be dried. So it's just, you know, nothing new out there, you know, it has been a lot more uh, talked about lately over the past couple of day, a couple of years, but vacuum drying has been around for quite some time. Early vacuum kilns, I first experienced mine um, back in 2003 or four at this hardware mill I worked at for a couple of summers. Uh, the mill purchased the, the vacuum kiln back in the 80s and they thought it was, you know, back then, a lot of the suppliers out there promised a lot with these kilns. And, and so there was a lot of issues that occurred and some of these uh, kilns either stop being used or they're used very little today. And matter of fact, the kiln that I was familiar with, you know, they turned into a walnut steamer and it did quite well with that, but it didn't do quite well with uh, drying lumber. It caused a lot of warping and, and checks and splits and everything. So some of the problems that were associated with the early vacuum kilns were that it was too low of heat, that very control, um, poor control systems compared to what we have today with very uh, computer automated processes. And there was a lack of incomplete understanding of the process and how to control it too. And there was a lot of large moisture distributions, a lot of wet pockets occurring, not equalization occurring. And that's what kind of led to a lot of the, the uh, defects and warping occurring with some of those earlier systems. So that kind of put a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths uh, because of that. But then um, over the past, uh, I would say, you know, 10, 15 years or more, a little bit more than that maybe, um, vacuum kilns have started to be renewed and, and there's been a, a lot more uses of those uh, and recently in the past couple of years, matter of fact. So why, you know, why has there been a renewed interest? Well, there's been a in better, faster drying rates. Uh, the kilns have came down a lot in cost. You know, the, back in the day, they used to be hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars to have these systems. And now that you can get one for less than $100,000 nowadays. Or you can even build your own. I know some people have done that. And um, so the, the cost has went down quite a bit. And uh, lumber quality is coming out much better than it was back uh, in the 80s or before. So it's just better quality and faster drying rates because, because of that too. And the lower operating costs, there's not much associated with it. You know, the electrical consumption is very little compared to operating some of the bigger conventional kilns. So it's, you know, people are getting more into that because the operating costs are low too. And then once again, the ability to dry smaller loads, just like the DH systems that we just heard about with uh, the vacuum kilns, uh, kilns range is from a couple hundred board feet to up to you know, 20 or thousand or so uh, board feet that can hold a decent charge in. So it's just the ability to, to dry smaller loads is a big interest nowadays, especially with the, the, the niche urban wood markets out there, the drying the slabs and stuff like that, that has uh, perked up some interest with these vacuum kilns because of the small quantities available. So if we have probably heard over the past few weeks uh, through this workshop is that, you know, there's three basic requirements for drying. You need a heat source, a mechanism to transfer the heat from the source of the wood, and a means to remove the water out of the wood too. So with vacuum drying, or I'll, let me start off with conventional drying first, is that the heat source there typically is steam. 
And it's passed through the heat exchangers. So in a in a kiln, uh, the heat exchangers would be on on this steam kiln here, picture on the uh, lower right of your screen. The steam kilns would be right above uh, the baffling system there that you see above the lumber packs and the exchangers. So the heat would uh, steam would go through those exchangers, and then a fans circulate, which be above those baffling system there, which circulate the warm air through the kiln and heat the lumber by convection heat. And then as the, the lumber dries, releases the moisture, then it's vented through the vents on top of the, the kiln there, so or in the back too. But that's how it is typically with conventional drying. With vacuum drying, what we have there is that the ambient pressure is lowered because of that vacuum that creates a total pressure difference between the inside of the wood. The water boils as it changes in the water vapor uh, during the vacuum drying. Then under this total pressure difference, the water vapor is removed from the wood. And under the pressure difference, most moisture moves in the longitudinal direction or the ends of the boards versus off the surface as conventional typically takes place. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more in depth here next, next couple of slides of how that works with a couple of figures. But uh, before that, I just want to show you here a, uh, a typical um, the pressure differences uh, during a couple of different systems. So the atmospheres that we're in, you know, we're at one atmosphere. So, and you know, higher elevations, your water boils at a different temperature, but and your different your atmosphere is a little bit different too. But where I'm sitting here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where this morning, you know, the weather was about 19 degrees out. It's up to 31 right now. So I had to give my update there. But um, so I'm sitting at a, you know one atmosphere pressure, and I could boil water at 212 degrees. So in a typical kiln that I operate at the Tech College up in Anago, Wisconsin, we're um, we're at about 0.13 atmospheres. So we're boiling water at 125 degrees uh, Fahrenheit versus 212. So basically that pressure difference is bringing that down quite a bit. Depends on the kiln too. I'm using a four inches of mercury in this kiln. And um, I think it's 28 inches of mercury is what typical one atmosphere is right now. So which once again, it boils water at 212 degrees versus in a vacuum kiln, it's going to be 125 degrees. But it depends on the system. I know some of the the other systems, they have a little bit higher inches of mercury, so your water boiling uh, temperature is a little bit higher too. So just something to be aware of. So looking at this a little bit closer with, uh, with this diagram here on conventional drying, you got a lot of uh, movement through um, either diffusion, through the, the moisture gradient that is coming from the core of the wood out to the surface. And before all that though, you probably have learned in the past couple of weeks to uh, fiber saturation point above and below. So typically fiber saturation point is 25% uh, moisture content or 30 moisture content, depending on what your, your species is there. So above that, you have a lot of free water um, ball flow occurring above your fiber saturation point. And then once again, below that, you're gonna have more diffusion occurring uh, through the cell walls out from the core into the, uh, the surface of the wood and be evaporated. However, with vacuum drying, what we have going on here now, we do have the free water bulk flow um, being removed quite a bit above the fiber saturation point. And also we have the water vapor bulk flow occurring now because of the, the vacuum being applied to it. So we have our um, non-boiling region, which is the, the part that is, you know, for our kiln, I want to talk about here is it's below 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Above that, you're going to have the boiling point occurring because it's much lower because of the vacuum being applied to it. And then you'll have more water vapor bulk flow occurring because of that vacuum being applied and boiling that water off at that temperature versus um, at a typical atmosphere, you know, 212 degrees. You're not going to reach that in a kiln um, because of that. The vacuum is not there to, to lower that down. So with that, you're going to have more surface evaporation and diffusion occurring at the longitudinal side because of the vacuum being applied to it. The water is going to be um, sucked out more at the ends of the, uh, the boards versus um, through the surfaces of, of that because of the pressure difference. So you have the pressure difference rather than diffusion is the primary driving force um, in, in vacuum drying versus conventional drying. So look at, let's take a look at briefly at drying times here. You know, pr pretty much, you know, it's like I said, we have faster drying times with vacuum drying compared to conventional. 
looking at Red Oak, for example, you know, that's going to be 25 to 35 dry days, you know, just green in the conventional kiln, not even having it air dry before that. So that's just fresh green. Uh, 25 to 35 days and vacuum kiln you're at three to nine days but that's all dependent on technology too which i'll highlight a little bit next here in a couple of slides about different types of applic uh, vacuum applications available and, and the speed behind that hard maple is uh you know typically in conventional kiln 10 to 12 days typically we can get it down to one to five at most seven depending on the system ash is another thing too is it's about the same on that and then the thicker the lumber, you know, obviously it's going to take more time to dry too. So, but vacuum drying, I don't have any softwood in here. Uh, typically what I've dried in this kiln is mostly, uh, is hard, hardwoods. So uh, from what I've been hearing, uh, hardwoods is much faster drying in a vacuum kiln than softwoods. Softwoods is about three times faster in a vacuum kiln. You're already getting, you know, softwoods being quite fast and conventional. So there's maybe a couple more hours or maybe a day or two faster, but it's not going to be as fast as uh, as a hard as hardwood lumber species are. So let's look at some heating methods. Like I said, as one of the, the sources for helping to dry the lumber. So heating methods and technology types in vacuum kiln here. So what we have available number one I want to talk about is conduction by direct contact, the hot plate or electric blanket, like the photo here on the right is. That's the the hot plate where hot water is flowing through. And we have convection using cycles of hot air. The cyclic systems, they're kind of the, the cheaper systems out there that uh, has been picking up lately um, in the markets um, and they work quite well too. And we have the convection using superheated steam and then we have radio frequency or dielectric heating. I haven't seen too many of those in the US, a lot of those are overseas. Um, some of the larger systems out there are superheated steam and there's, there, there are some benefits because of that, that's the steam being used in that, and I'll highlight here a little bit too. And a lot of that deals with the uh, the relieving of stresses. So, so what do we need for vacuum drying? Well, we have to have a pressure vessel, and that's kind of limits the size or amount of wood that you be able to dry. Uh, this system here that we have here is a couple hundred board feet, and they can get quite big too, up to I've been seeing twenty thousand board feet too. We have a, uh, a low heat requirements. There's a vacuum pump, which is the little uh, Part in the back right of that or left of that kiln and then also there we have to have some sort of temperature temperature control through either the wood core so we can either monitor there's an rtd that goes inside the wood core they can have present in there and that'll help adjust the the temperature as the the temperature of the wood is being controlled or there's ways of monitoring that through the loss of water that is being condensed and being drained out of the system too so we can either operate that either or with this system. Um, depends on the type of system that you may have available for you, but some of that is um, they control easier either through condensed water or the wood core and you just have to figure out what works best for you. So here's just a screenshot of a, of a typical schedule that I ran for hard maple and um, the vacuum being applied to it. So the vacuum is the blue line down the lower part of the, of the uh, the graph here and this whole overall it took about uh, 58 hours I think it was to run this kiln and you can see where I kind of stopped it it was about 62 63 hours later or at total but it took about 58 hours to dry this load of four quarter hard maple and um, so the vacuum being applied to it the 29 is is kind is like I said the one atmosphere are right there where we're at right now in present atmosphere of 28, 29. So don't look at that really, but we brought it down to uh, four inches of mercury. And that's kind of shown there on the very far left of that blue line. And then as the temperature rose, so did uh, the water temperature too. Um, you can see it went up to 140. We held it at 140 degrees. So typically what I would like to do with 140 degrees is use that for a way to equalize uh, the, the load before I bring it up to a higher temperature in order to boil off more of that water. So we brought up to 160 degrees for a few, um, about an hour or so, then we brought up, turned the system back off and it should have been done. And uh, by doing so, bringing that up, it finally boils it down to get it to a seven, 8% moisture content, what is needed up in, in the Midwest here versus down the Southern part, you know, you, you might need to get it down to three to 4% moisture content um, for your, your markets that you may have down there. But that just 
may need you to bring that temperature up a little bit higher or let it you know equalize at 160 degrees a little bit longer than what I needed to um, for the load I was drawing. So here's the, once again, the, the conductive heating. It's a heat transfer by direct contact with the hot surface or you can, or the older systems, they had electric blanks, blankets out there. And they did have some uniform heating issues because of light blankets versus the, the hot water flowing through the plates. It's much easier to, to get that uniform heating of the lumber. And um, it's kind of labor intensive though, if, if you've seen uh, some of this being load, uh, handled and, and loaded up in a, in a vacuum kiln. It's, uh, the slabs are quite heavy, obviously, not only the wood, but just dealing with the plates that are filled with water. So a lot of manual labor there and, and time commitment to do this. And you gotta, you know, make sure if you don't have a full load, you gotta figure out some block, ways to block that chamber up so you can get equal drying done and keep that pressure difference uh, fine. And plus depends on the system too. Like the system that we have here has a, a rubber membrane on top. So in order for that system to be working accurately, that rubber membrane needs to be kind of tight at the top of the load. So you got to have that whole chamber pretty much filled up with, a, with lumber and a plate on the very top. So you're not allowing that membrane to fall all the way down and, and lose a lot of the vacuum and some issues to occur. But it's very labor intensive. Some of the larger systems do have robots, robotics available to help overcome that labor loading challenge. So Here's just a diagram of um, an operation that could be potential for a larger system. And then here's the photo of it, actually how it works the very far right. You can see where they load the lumber and the plates on by robots. And then the, the, the tracks slide down to each of the, the kilns to be loaded up into the, the, the chambers and that. So helps that quite a bit with that labor challenge. Now let's take a look at another system here, cyclic or conventional. Um, vacuum drying. So this lumber is heated using conventional methods, typically like a conventional conventional uh, oven that you may have in your house. Um, it just uh, uses a fan and a heating element to circulate that air through that chamber, just as the diagram on the left shows here, uh, how the fan and heating occurs, it just circulates through that pack and charge and it dries it. Um, through a heating phase and then a vacuum is drawn causing the drying as the temperature starts to drop the cycle goes back on until it repeats all the way down until it reaches the right moisture content that you're, that you're looking for uh, for your end product. Our next system here that we have for vacuum drying is a superheated steam system. So basically uh, it's used to, under a low pressure and forced through uh, the superheated steam is used in under, under low pressure and conditions and forced through the courses of lumber. Like I said, this system here is good for relieving a lot of the stresses. Some of the other systems out there, you can equalize by holding it at a, at a temperature that will do that 140 degrees, like I like to do with the, the vacuum, um, the press system there. But on the typical other systems, you just can't, or I should say that you can't really condition it that really effectively, um, by setting a, a uh, some of the software programs, some of it, if you're drawing at a lower temperature, it'll equalize and also condition, but it's just trying to figure that out. And with our system that we have available, it's there's been a couple loads I have had condition that came out well with uh, stresses being relieved, but some that haven't, and I'm still working with that as we speak, matter of fact, on trying to figure out the best way of doing so. And it's kind of hard to deal with that because you don't really have control, full control um, to the program uh, as some of the companies do out there that they, they can control kind of behind the scenes and figure out which ways work best for the customer that they have to. So something to think about. Then lastly, the last system I want to highlight for vacuum drying is radio frequency drying. Heating occurs by using an alternative electrical magnet field causing polar water molecules in the wood to change um, fields here. So it just rapidly causes the wood to heat up. You don't see a lot of these many in the US. I've seen a lot over in Europe. Um, some are in the US, the smaller systems, but majority of them are, are still over in Europe. And um, from what I understand, that they work quite well. All right, let's highlight some of the advantages of vacuum drying. Like I said, you know, there's much shorter drying times. Lower temperature, uh, allow the wood 
to retain its original color. So it's great for, for hard maple, uh, cherry, walnut that does well with. And uh, because of the lower drying time or temperatures still, it allows the wood to be stronger. So the, the higher temperatures, you know, the wood becomes more brittle, but because of this, you're, you're drying at a lower, lower temp, the, the wood is still pretty strong. The quality is what we have been seeing as, as good as conventional drying. And because it's a closed system, you're drying within that um, closed chamber. There's no VOCs being emitted. There's no venting occurring like a conventional system. So it's all going basically out that drain every so often when that water is drained out of that system. Those, uh, those compounds are being relieved that way. And because of that closed system and uh, how it's heated, the lumber is heated to dry, it's energy, very energy efficient, so. And then looking at that too, some more advantages here, uh, uniform final moisture content, if you equalize it at a temperature that you need to have 140 degrees, for example, for a, a set period of time, it'll equalize that and a lot of the, the charges come out very uniform. You can dry mixed species and thicknesses. I have, I try to dry typically um, species that are very uh, similar in um, specific gravity. And then also try to put them in about the same type of moisture content. I don't really don't want to put anything that's going to be already, you know, much drier than something else going in because you might overdry the other stuff that's really dry versus the stuff that's kind of still green. So keep that very similar with um, specific gravity and moisture contents. And by allowing that speedy, speed along um, faster drying rates, you can have just in time inventory. So you, you don't have to keep all that wood in your air drying operation. You just put what you need in the vacuum kiln a few days to a few hours or a few hours later, you can have a, a charge done. And because of that just in time inventory, you, you'll, you don't have, need to have that much space available for that kiln drying. Or, or excuse me, air drying uh, capabilities. And just all you really need is a space to have a, to load your chamber and to hold your kiln. But with anything, there are some disadvantages. You have the higher cost of energy and equipment related just to get that operation going. Uh, it's gonna depend on how big of a system you need, but you know, you gotta install it. It's gonna, you might need a train or so. So there's a lot of uh, cost up front just to get that you know, equipment installed into your operation. The vessel capacity is kind of limited. So, you know, if you, if you want to start out with a couple hundred board feet, you know, get into it a little bit, but then if you want to get up, you know, you get some operations going, you like what you're doing. You know, you, you might need to buy a whole new system because you're kind of stuck there. So I know it's a couple of guys that start with a smaller system. They've been upgrading slowly to bigger systems and it's been working out for them, but you know, it's something to think about because you're going to spend that money up front on a, on a system and, Maybe a year or two later, you're gonna be potentially increasing that because your sales have gone up. So think about that going in. Where do you want to start out with your business? And then each system is is different. You know, not only the drying process is different, but the software behind it. It could be a lot of technical uh, difficulties too. Um, what I've been seeing too, you know, it's you trying to. It's the the same system behind each, you know, it doesn't matter the size, you still have the, the pump, you got the chamber, you got the software, you got the, the heating element or the, you know, how it's going to be heated. It's just trying to control that. You may over dry it quite a bit. What I've been seeing is that with our small chamber, we have a lot of heat going into it. So we're trying to, we're driving it more like a Corvette versus kind of, we need to drive it much, you know, less. We need a, you know, more, much smaller vehicle behind it. And it's, it's kind of over drying in a way and not really relieving the stresses out yet as I would like to see. So that's why it's gonna take time to understand that. So you gotta really understand it. It's gonna, you gotta play with it quite a bit in order to figure out how to properly dry. And so you might be ruining a couple of loads here and there before you, you actually get it dialed in uh, per se as, as accurate as you like. And it's gonna take some time to do that versus some of those other systems that you can, um, you know, you got some of the uh, schedules up front um, this here, you kind of have to dial in to, to meet your needs. And, and some of the software programs out there, they do have capabilities to set it and forget it, which is great, but you just have to understand because sometimes you may be drawing a, a different species than that, that system is used to, not used to, or maybe a different thickness too, or product type. And you may have, you know, everything might not come out equal or uniform in moisture contents. So you gotta 
put it back in and let it sit for a little bit longer. So it's gonna take some time there behind it to understand the capabilities that your system has. And it's dependent on, um, on permeability too. White oak is a species that you know isn't really recommended to dry in this. It's gonna take just as long as it would in a conventional system. Red oak, you can dry it well, but white oak you can't because just that tyloses that are present. And that's why, you know, they're straight for wine barrels and whiskey barrels, but it's because it holds that that liquid. But trying to dry is still not gonna take it's gonna take a long time in a vacuum kiln. And like I said, equalization, you can do that in a vacuum kiln conditioning. Depends on the system that you have, the steam kiln, steam vacuum, uh, superheated steam vacuum chamber. The capabilities are there, but the other ones, you know, you don't have that ease to do to relieve the stresses as you would with a conventional system. And like I said, it's a complex technical operation. Skills are required, so you got to kind of understand the system you have, the software behind it to help speed along um, the drying process. And then there could be some loading and unloading challenges. Like I said, it's very hands-on with some of these systems um, versus uh, some of the other ones out there. Some of the, the heat using the plates are quite heavy. Some of the systems, the cyclic systems use sticks. So they're pretty similar to a conventional system. Not as hard to, to, uh, to load and unload, but it's still gonna take you some time to do. So preferred applications for vacuum drying. Well, you got high valued species, walnut, thick slabs are great. Timbers are being done in this quite a bit nowadays, especially with the live edge slab markets with the, uh, the increase in demand for that. So a lot of the, the companies are picking up these vacuum kilns in order to speed that along. It's gonna take you much longer time to, to air dry and conventional dry. So these vacuum kilns do work well for that. Decorative and thick veneer. And then difficult to dry species. Some of the tropical have been done in this, um, but once again, white oak, you know, it's not really recommended, but just because of the economics behind it, it's still gonna take just as long as it would in conventional drying. And these are great for the small scale operations, a uh, couple hundred board feet up to a couple thousand. So great for that. So I just wanna highlight a little bit of some research that's been done with vacuum drying. And the study that was done back in Virginia Tech a few years back, they looked at just, comparing uh, conventional versus uh, vacuum drying uh, large scale operations. And what they found with uh, the vacuum kiln system and that you're gonna have you know, that just in time inventory needs available because of that work in progress is much less than you would in a conventional system because you don't have to have all that lumber out there drying in the air drying yard. You just have what you have, put in the, the vacuum kiln, dry it and it comes out within a few hours or a few days. So you're gonna have increased flexibility for your customers, decreased lead times, and the reduced amount of inventory that you need out there. So what the study showed here is that between conventional lumber drying and vacuum drying, there was a 52% reduction in, excuse me, in the inventory requirements there. So that was pretty interesting to, to see all that, the larger scale operations. And then what we have done here at, at um, North Central Technical College and the DNR, Wisconsin, we have looked at using the system that we have available and recently put together a, a publication with the Forest Service on comparing uh, vacuum drying effects on and coloration of hard maple, which I can have Patrick sent to you or put in the folder too later on. But so we looked at comparing that and I'll share some more of the results here in a little bit, but we looked at flatness of lumber coming out with this, the press system here and it came out very flat. Um, the gentleman here in the, the picture here, he's measuring the flatness uh, with the a device there that they use for measuring hardwood flooring. And the lumber came out quite quite flat uh, at first. And then we took that and put it in an environmental chamber, compared it with a conventional dried hard maple too. And over time, you know, burning it up to higher moisture content in the environmental chamber and you're burning it back down. There was some movement, but not much, um, but still just coming out of the chamber, right out of the kiln, it was, it was very flat. Case hardening did vary, as I mentioned earlier, between charges. So like I said, there's, there's really no definite way of, of reducing that stress with adding you know, moisture into that chamber. So it's just a way of learning uh, how to control your, your kiln schedule or your, your software program in order to reduce that. And you're, you're definitely gonna have to work with, your, with the, uh, the kiln manufacturer to figure that out. And um, we definitely did find some tight moisture content throughout the charges, you know, we conducted quite a bit of testing through sampling uh, through different, pretty much cut up a whole kiln 
looked at different moisture contents and quite a bit it was quite tight just because of that the way that the the um, the hot plates dry that with the water going through and now i'll talk a little bit about the color comparison um, test that we have done in the past here so what we did here uh, we took uh, five number number one grade hard maple logs they were all a little over eight foot long and the diameters range from 14 to 16 inches at the small end so we harvest them back in 2019 in the fall in the central part of Wisconsin. Uh, the logs were not encoded and were sawn uh, October 3rd in 2019. Seven to nine boards were selected from each of the five logs based on the following criteria. We wanted all sapped wood because of the white wood available, clear and free of discoloration. We dried it down to what we require here in the Midwest of 7% moisture content. So what we had going into the chamber in both of these kilns, we compared it and the conventional steam kiln that we have available there. And then we also have our vacuum kiln. So we took, what we did is divided each board, we cut in half. So one board went, half the board went in the steam kiln and the other half went in the vacuum kiln. So we had in total about 206 board feet used for the whole study. We kind of modeled this study off of a study that Patrick did, matter of fact, in, uh, in New York a while back through um, steam kiln uh, conventional system schedules that he had. So we looked at here, what, what happened is that um, the samples in the vacuum kiln were dried in 58 hours using the vacuum cycle of, a, of um, 10 inches, excuse me, it was uh, four inches of mercury. Uh, and we held 140 degrees Fahrenheit for eight hours. And the charge was completed when the wood core reached 160 degrees. So that graph I showed you a few slides back showing the, the temperature over time up to 160 degrees. That was the schedule that we used. And then in the conventional drying steam kiln, we used um, T1C5 schedule. And that took us about 288 hours to dry that down to 7% um, moisture content. So what we found is that we took eight readings um, with a photospectrometer. So if you go to any of the, the paint stores or box stores out there and you're looking for to match a, a color of paint to a pillow you may have or some old paint in your house, um, that photo spectrometer, which is the photo I'm holding there, that machine there, they use something like that to, to determine what that color is by comparing it to um, some set points out there for lightness and some color factors from um, orange to, to green blue to, to red and all that stuff. And so, so that's kind of what we did too. So we had eight samples for each board. So we tried to take that in between the grain to make sure we had no discoloration because of the darker grain. So we would have that white color available. And then um, we had 40 samples that we compared. So as a whole, the L factor, we used this one study that was done back in 2000 to compare it with. So the L factor, which is this, uh, the L star there, we looked at between 79 to 88 is what the average consumer prefers for a bright, colored hard maple sap board, sapwood board. And so we used that number there. And then we had the A factor and B just to show different um, colorations available between uh, green, blue and, and, and red, yellow and stuff like that. And we've compared that. So what we found is that vacuum and um, the conventional system met those requirements. And there really wasn't a, a, a specific, um, you know, this uh, difference at all. So it was very similar. We did notice with the vacuum kiln samples, the, the little blue on the left there that, of that graph, it was a little bit tighter than versus conventional system, but overall it, it met the requirements that the consumers are looking for. So there wasn't much, um, um, nothing was brighter or darker or any, anything in there. So that worked out well with that, that schedule that we used with the conventional system. However, the main thing though, that we did find is that you know the, the faster drying times you know, it was nearly five times faster in the vacuum kiln than it was in the conventional system but you know with that the, the vacuum kiln though it did take you know some time to, to load and unload more so in a way than um well it was about the it took a little bit longer i guess in the, in the conventional system too with laying sticks but it was much heavier plates to load um caused a couple more people to help out in the uh, vacuum kiln than he would in a conventional kiln. But like I said, there was no visual color difference uh, between the two drying methods. 
And basically the results have demonstrated that vacuum drying can produce industry acceptable white hard maple as compared to conventional drying systems. So it is pretty neat to see that, um, you know, this should work well with, you know, looking at producing kind of red, uh, that center or the, the heart of the, the a black cherry too, and, and also keeping that darker um, walnut complexion to color capabilities to that. So that's, it's, we should help with that because of lower temperatures too, so. Yeah, so that's pretty much it on, on vacuum drying. Um, thanks again for having me and look forward to any of your questions. Thank you, Scott. And uh, if anybody does have any questions, they can feel free to uh, put them into the Q&A window there. And so one thing I, I did, I forgot to mention about Scott is he is uh, taking time off today from his uh, nine day Wisconsin deer hunt <laughs> to uh, join us today. And so, you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's a big deal in Wisconsin. It's essentially, it's a, it's a nine day uh, state holiday for most people. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I yeah. have a few questions about, uh, about vacuum drying. And so, you know, in the Southwest, there is a lot of uh, live edge slab production sales. And some of that production is with the uh, mesquite, the velvet mesquite, the honey mesquite. Mm -hmm. And so mesquite has a very similar uh, pore structure to that of white, you know, a white ash. Okay. Uh, I guess it's semi ring porous, mm -hmm. you know, what, you know, it's uh, just very similar to white ash. So like, would you just go with a, a typical dry kiln operator schedule for white ash to put in a vacuum kiln? Like how would you approach mm -hmm. the scheme? Well, it depends. Yeah, no, good question on that, Patrick. I mean, it really depends on the system you have. So a lot of the cheaper, you know, more um, economic, economical systems out there, they come with pretty much a software program that's um, can be built for specific, species requirements. So, you know, since that's a kind of an easy to dry species such as ash, um, you could probably go with like a medium system and, you know, have it ramp up slow over time, obviously, but you can be a little bit more, you know, quicker with it versus, you know, some of the lower, harder to dry species or the harder to dry species you want to ramp that up at a slower temperature rate. Um, you know, I could see that being done, at, you know, be, you know, at most maybe a week, depending on, you know, four quarter, you know, if you want to do one inch thick or so, but thicker, you know, obviously, obviously may take, you know, two to more weeks, depending on how thick it is. Um, but yeah, ashes, and, you know, that sounds like a very similar species that, like you said, Patrick, so it shouldn't take, I wouldn't, you know, be more or less a medium, easy schedule to dry with that. Um, manually, you know, like, I, you know, if you do have a kiln system, either a cyclical or a press system like this that I was talking about, um, you do, I would recommend, you know, holding that at 140 degrees for a set amount of hours that you may understand to equalize that. So I, I have experienced some um, companies I work for here in Wisconsin. Uh, they, for example, they've been drying some pine recently and they thought it, they ran through the system and everything. And that was uh, calculated out, you know, the software system program and everything. And they finished and they dropped off and, you know, the customer had it and they thought it was equalized well, and it wasn't. And some of the boards were 7%, some were as high as 20%. You know, with pine, you know, that can get, you know, 19% is, is technically dried, but what the, the customer wanted it down to 7%. So they don't, they weren't happy with that. So the main thing there I like to highlight is just, just equal, you know, hold it a set amount of time to equalize it. So you do have it you know, that uniform moisture content when you are finished with it, because sometimes you just can't um, go with what the software system has. But yeah, right. it'll just take some time to understand. Yep. Thanks, Patrick. And that's also why I mentioned, you know, the, the live edge slab, because I'm assuming they're not going to be put through a ripsaw and yeah. <laughs> had much uh, secondary manufacturing done to them. So, you know, if, if there is some internal drying stresses, it may not be as important mm -hmm. to the to consumer as, say, you know, a piece of a quarter Yep. Oak that was going to be put through a you know surfaced and plain and ripped mm -hmm. oh definitely no that's a good point there yeah especially with the live edge slabs you're going to process down more typically anyhow but um yeah i've seen that you know with the really thick stuff i mean i have i had one person i was working with they did have a really thick stock um walnut that they wanted to rip down because of they wanted to rip it down to a thinner almost veneer size uh, product in that. And so there was some, some issues because of that stress related. So, uh, it did take, um, a lot more time involvement because of that and just trying to understand that going in and 
And it's just, uh, yeah, you just have to be aware what's, what's the final result going to be with that product? You know, are you going to process it down to further, you know, smaller components or are you going to keep it, you know, as a live edge slab? So just, you know, figure that out and that'll help you to determine, you know, how much, you know, if you need to relieve that stress associated with that. So. Sure. And there is a, a question that in the chat window about uh, how does encodings affect uh, drying? Oh. Yeah, I know it's, it's definitely, it's, um, I, from what my experience with it, we have put a couple of kiln samples in with, uh, with the sample paint on the ends of it. And, you know, if you put it in right away, um, it will, you know, obviously it's still wet, so it's going to kind of suck it off in a way. But um, from my understanding, I haven't done it. I ha Well, there has been some coming in that had some of the slabs, matter of fact, that were air dried, that were coated. And they did still have it on there. It kind of did slow down the drying, obviously, because you're still, you're going to dry it more longitudinally, like I mentioned, through the vacuum drying. So, you know, that's going to slow down the drying rate because of that. Um, and over, over time, it will, you know, come off because you are bringing that, you know, up to a boiling point and um, it's going to kind of evaporate off there anyhow. So it's just, you know, if you're going to dry it prior to that, get that to help speed along your, your process for those thick slabs, you know, I would recommend, you know, doing the end coat because it's going to help reduce the, the loss of degrade anyhow, because the, the checks or end splits that may occur in the air drying process. But, you know, if you're going to put it in right away, fresh green, you know, you probably don't need to do that just because it, it just might be an added cost that you may be just sucking off anyhow in the very beginning anyhow. But like I said, if you're going to air dry it for a while, yeah, I, re I would recommend, you know, end coating it there just to re reduce those drying defects. For sure. And uh, one final question for me is, um, you know, dealing with the urban lumber manufacturing businesses, you, you do get a lot of contaminants, you know, uh, in your uh, wood sometimes, such as insulators, you know, how, do, how does that affect your uh, vacuum yeah. system? No, that's, that's good. Um, yeah, we had a, Patrick knows we had a, an issue with that. We had, a, there was a, an insulator that came in on a load of walnut and we didn't, nobody caught it. And, and the only person that caught it was the sawmill, but they didn't tell us about it. And it kind of, they had to catch it because it, it, you can see where the blade was hit it and ruined it. But so the main thing there is, depending on the system you have, if you have, you know, the pl platen system, be aware of any metal or any other stones or things that may damage your plates. Because those plates are aluminum. They're you can weld them if you do punch a hole in them, but it's going to cost you some money and some downtime. So be aware of that. The the cichlid systems that use stick uh, wooden sticks stickers in that, you know, you might not need. You know, that stuff may be fine with that because you know you have that diff distance between those sections of boards. You don't have those metal plates, but always check going in. You know, you just you just never know because there's definitely been a couple times that some rocks have punctured um, a plate and also that. <laughs> That uh, insulator sure did a number. So, <laughs> sure, and I'm, I'm I'm certain there's a lot of ponderosa pine trees down in the southwest with uh, fences in them that have just grown oh. to the fences. Yep. So well, I yeah, that, that can't be good for the plantains either with the plates. Mm -hmm. That brings up another point too. Um, any softwoods that have you know resins in that associated with it, those plates do get out quite messy. So you're gonna have to clean those uh, um, once in a while to re remove the resins in that, but. Um, you may have with the cichlid systems too, from what I've been understanding, you know, that will have some potential um, issues on the, on the bottom of your kiln of your chamber and that. So you got to kind of clean that out once in a while, but yeah, just something to think about too. Cause those systems, you know, those chambers vessels are, are stainless steel and that. So, but some of the components, um, that on the track, matter of fact, they aren't stainless steel. So some of that rusts out. So I know from drying red oak in that, you know, it, you don't have a lot of tannins associated with that. And um so that's going to cause some issues too with uh some of the metal and that by rusting it quite a bit so just be aware of that going in and just pay attention to it and, and and you know perform that you know that maintenance you know once in a while to to help reduce you know issues in the long run too so yeah for sure and i i just saw a question come in that is the uh as i would say it's the most asked question of any utilization and marketing specialist and that is what to do with the uh, thick cookies you know how do you <laughs> would a vacuum drying be best for those thick cookies? And, yeah. you know, like I, I always recommend putting the thick cookies into a pool of ethylene glycol. 
but I know there's some commercial chemicals out there too. And, you know, if you have a pool of ethylene glycol sitting around your house, it's not the safest thing to do. So, uh, you know, I don't always recommend that, but you know, that's what we were always told in college. So I didn't know if you were told something else or if you uh, have any other um, solutions. No, I mean, that's what I used to, I mean, that's what I recommend too, is uh, PEG, glycol on that, or um, the Forest Service, there was a study done a while back that used egg whites, a uh, mixture of that to help reduce that. And I can put that in, give that to Patrick too, to, to have out there in, on your, um, in your file folder. But with vacuum drying, um, we have dried a couple sets of cookies in the system we have had, and I've, I've known some people that do that quite a bit. And, um, you know, with anything, any, you know, any cookie like that, you may have a couple, you know, the saying goes, you know, if you, you want a, a decent cookie, you know, you may have to cut 20 of them versus two because something's, you know, they're gonna, there's a potential to split just because how wood dries. Um, but yeah, there is a, it's a vacuum drying, you know, I have seen that work well in versus conventional, but just because of how it's um, the process behind it too. And also the, the plates there and, the cyclic systems too work well for that too. But once again, you know, just, you may have to produce more going in because there is that chance of some cracks and splits to occurring there. But um, the one load that we have done, it, it, it turned out quite well. And just the main thing though is, you know, getting that held to equalize to get the, all that moisture out. Um, because once again, you know, for those hot plate systems though, uh, the wood, you know, like I said, the, the moisture will re be relieved out of the ends of the large tunnel. So when that plate is on top of that, it's not going to dry it well uh, because the, the ends are blocked up by the plates. So, you know, it'll slow it down and you may see some uh, moisture variations between the core and the surface of that cookie too. So just um, something to consider and just, you know, may, you may want to hold that at a longer time period at a, you know, for example, 140. 40 degrees just to equalize a little better, but just something to understand. You know, it's going to take you some time to understand, you know, to, to learn your system that you may have. And, but I've seen that, you know, cookies have been much easier to dry in a vacuum field system than, you know, in the past systems. And in terms of DH units and, and cookies, I, I imagine uh, DH units would essentially uh, be the same as conventional steam with a large slab yeah, cookie. Yeah. It would just cause it to crack unless you had some kind of way to control that moisture. Yeah, which paid would work well with glycol on that. Yeah. Yep. And I, I do find it interesting that you did mention white oak in your presentation because uh, <laughs> the uh, the Forest Price Laboratory and myself, we have received questions about putting white oak into vacuum kilns. And so I, I didn't think of those tyloses as being a problem. So I have to, yeah, I might have to circle um, back to you on that. So no, it's all right. I mean, we have done it a couple of times and it just, you know, between all the wet pockets, uh, you know, white, white oak is known to just have wet pockets anyhow in general. And um, it just took, Oh my, forever. It was, you know, it was thick wood. We had slabs going in and it just wasn't, you know, efficient enough to make it worthwhile to, to do it really. And um, yeah, it's just, even the manufacturers really kind of don't recommend it either just because it's just, it's not really economical to even do. So versus, you know, even having a DH system where it's going to take a while, but you know, it's a much cheaper operation to operate. So, but yeah, it's just uh, something to consider going in. Well, thanks again for your time today, Scott. Yeah, no um, problem, Patrick. I want to go ahead and stop sharing the screen. I just have a few slides to uh, share before we close out the top of the hour. And um, you're welcome to stay on if you want to, Scott. I'm going to mention sure. um, a couple of things that you may want to comment on or just provide some, uh, some you know, impart some wisdom to us. So the first thing is just um, additional training opportunities. So... Um, you know, Scott, he works in uh, Wisconsin, so he works a lot with uh, the school in Antigo, and, you know, they have a uh, typically a, is a three or four day drying class uh, held every August, and so I, I thought that was pretty good this year. That's my first time attending that class, and I, it, in my opinion, the uh, class in Wisconsin, you know, it, it's geared towards the uh, large manufacturer and the uh, small manufacturer. So, I mean, you know, it, it's a good, uh, it's a good combination of both um, aspects of lumber drying. The other option is um, Syracuse, New York has a in-person drying course also typically held in January. So uh, if you like uh, skiing in uh, upstate New York, um, 
that might be something you want to consider. I would say that that particular course, you know, I, I've also taken part in that course in, in Syracuse, and that is very much geared towards the industrial side of it. You know, that is um, focused primarily in hardwood lumber drying, and it's very much focused uh, towards the industrial operations. And then the, the third one I found is the one in uh, North, Car uh, North Carolina. So, you know, that's put on by Harry Watt and uh, Phil Mitchell. I don't have a lot of experience with that particular course, but, you know, it's definitely uh, an option if you're looking to get more in-person training. Uh, virtual training is also available. So uh, Oregon State University has a online virtual uh, portal you can log on to. It, it, it does cost a few dollars to take part in that. Uh, I think it's a recorded training, so I, I don't think there's any, any back and forth or conversation going on. And then the other uh, training that's available virtually is the National Hardwood Lumber Association does have webinars uh, uh, annually or weekly, sometimes monthly. And most of their uh, webinars are put on YouTube for uh, viewing later. Um, it's a lot of what they talk about is uh, very applicable to drying softwood lumber also. So I find those to be pretty, uh, pretty useful. And then also I'll, I'll speak about Nile dry kiln systems. They also have a YouTube series going over uh, various lumber drying techniques. Uh, you know, and so that's also something you can check out. I don't have that link right now. Uh, organizations. And so there's a lot of organizations out there that can help you uh, expand your markets and also expand your expertise in lumber processing and lumber drying. And so one of them is the Urban Wood Network. And so it's a nationwide network. Uh, they have, uh, I don't know how many members they have in the Southwest. I, I just became familiar with this organization uh, within the last year or so. And they do have a new executive director, uh, Carrie Devine. And so I would definitely uh, encourage you to check out that particular organization if you're looking, if you're mostly dealing with uh, urban wood utilization. And continuing education, uh, this is in-person classes. And so NC State Wood Product Extension Office, they do have two people that will uh, host workshops, uh, essentially in a lot of different places. Um, Right now, they are funded through the Wood Education Resource Center. And so they are primarily holding workshops in the uh, Northeast and the Southeast. And so a lot of their work is dealing with um, small to medium-sized manufacturers. And they have uh, two upcoming workshops in the uh, summer of 2022. And that is the National Firewood Workshop and also a Live Edge slab workshop and both of those are scheduled to take place in Wisconsin. And I'll just say that, you know, Wisconsin in the summer is a pretty nice place to be. Uh, safety related resources. And so if you're working within this industry, you know, you definitely have to know the OSHA rules to keep yourself safe and your employees safe. This is one of the most uh, dangerous occupations out there, uh, sawmilling, logging, forestry. And so this, uh, this webinar was put on by uh, Penn State. It, it is specifically focused on uh, safety in the kiln drying industry. And so I will provide this uh, presentation afterwards to Damon and he can share this presentation with you and the link to this uh, recorded webcast. This was put on by uh, Penn State Extension, a person named uh, Scott Weikert. And just by coincidence, Scott also worked for the uh, same company that I did and also worked for the same company that Scott Lyon did. So uh, uh, a lot of, lot, lot of knowledge, uh, lot of knowledge there within the industry um, for your uh, ability to absorb. And then OSHA also has this uh, tool. It is specifically designed for sawmill safety, and so you can access that tool there. And you know, it's also it it also has a very uh, concise uh, section on dry kilns, and so everything that OSHA mandates for dry kiln operations. And so it's just always good to know what the rules are in your state and nationally as you're expanding your sawing and drying operations. And then in closing, I'll just uh, again, highlight the uh, National Wood Energy Technical Assistance Team. You know, this team is uh, funded by the Wood Education Resource Center and they provide technical assistance on wood energy projects. 
which is vitally important to uh, the Southwest to uh, dispose of biomass and any other, any other byproducts from the forest restoration activities. And if you are interested in getting a free uh, technical assessment from this team, uh, contact Lou McCreary at the contact information at the bottom of the screen. And again, this is my contact information here. Uh, feel free to contact me. I, I work in Milwaukee, but sometimes my uh, work does transcend, a, transcend across different forest service regions. And I'm happy to uh, answer any questions I have. And so I will uh, stop sharing my screen now and turn this back over to Damon. And so as uh, you know, the main instructor, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in the last uh, four weeks. If you're watching this recorded, um, you know, it's a lot to take in at once. So just my final advice, just to, uh, as Henko said, go slow with your dry kiln systems at first, get to know your systems and, you know, just dry at a rate that is appropriate to your uh, timber species. And of course, always do it uh, safely. So I'll give uh, Damon and Rich an opportunity to come on and close us out if there's anything else that needs to be said. Hey, Patrick, there's a, a question in the Q&A from Tim. Um, do you know if the 2021 or the 2022 state utilization personnel directory is still being produced? Uh, it, 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 it is. And so um, it is a virtual product now. I uh, worked with uh, Charlie Becker at the Forest Pass Laboratory to make a uh, online directory of state utiliza utilization marketing specialists across the nation. And so uh, we are working through the, uh, the fun final process of getting this posted online to a Forest Service website. And so I don't think you'll see anything out this week given it's, uh, it's a holiday week pretty much. I'll be out of the office for the rest of this week. But um, I think, by the first week of December, you should see some uh, notices coming out. And so I, I think it's pretty neat. It's, uh, you know, it allows for much, much quicker updating of contact information. You know, the uh, paper versions always seem to be outdated as soon as you uh, finalize them. And so with this online GIS web app that we developed, um, you know, it's much more uh, easier to update and keep uh, accurate. Okay, with that, I, uh, I'm gonna wave goodbye and uh, I'll see y'all sometime in the future. Thank you.